it's checking in with Anthony and Glenn, teaching you to be the hotelier that you want to be. It's checking in with Anthony and Glenn. Anthony, happy holidays. Glenn Houseman, how are you? It's great to see you. That's a nice shirt. looks nice and crisp. You look a little up today. You don't look so tired. Uh, you didn't shave, but you still look uh, handsome. And uh, it's just really good to be in your presence. Oh, that's really sweet of you to say. But I got to be honest with you, Anthony. This is the second show in a row where I'm a little off my game because of food-related issues. Let's not talk about the lockers again. No, we're not. That was last. That was the last episode. This I've got a whole other, whole other food issues on on this one. I had the great fortune to do an amazing speaking gig with the good folks at Hilton this week down in Memphis, but. When you go to Memphis, you've got to eat like you're in Memphis. So I started off my uh, I started off my trip with an amazing uh, experience at Gus's Fried Chicken, and then uh, wrapped it up at great the uh, the great Central Barbecue where I had ribs and pulled pork. Is that why you look a little chubby today? Uh, that's exactly why I look a little chubby today. And I got to tell you, I was going to say you were saying I look great and all that, but I'm feeling a little off my game <laughs> because of too much barbecue, too much fried chicken, too much goodness. I was in the city all day yesterday, yep. and I was tired. I actually went home and I and I apologized to my daughter because I was I was a little crabby and I don't come home crabby ever like I'm just you know I, I don't, I'm not a crabby kind of person right um and uh, and I realized why I was crabby I after my long long day I uh, spoke a lot uh, I decided to go because I was starving I was uh, decided to go to Katz's Deli and anyone that knows Katz's Deli knows the pastrami on rye oh. is the best in the world I eat the whole sandwich the whole what? Hold on, hold on. <laughs> I ate the whole sandwich. <laughs> Did the people from Guinness stop by? Because nobody could eat a whole sandwich. Usually, you eat half of one and take the other half home. I ate the whole thing in my car as I was driving. <laughs> <In> your car. <laughs> Just picture that right now. You taking a bite out of the sandwich, crying because you can't stop eating it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but 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 explain to them what a big like like you can't put it in right. your mouth. It's not it, it's not just a sandwich. I mean, it is a sandwich, and the way that they pile up the, the the meat is it has like a giant hump on it, right? And usually a sandwich, uh, you, you get when you go to, when you, your mom makes you I'm a still sandwich. I'm still a giant hump. That's yeah, funny. When your that. mom makes you a sandwich, it's like three pieces of bologna. When you go out to a diner. It's like five pieces of bologna. Here, it's like 100 slices of pastrami or corned beef or whatever stacked up on top of each other to create something that's like literally- It's a cow between two pieces of bread. No exaggeration, four or five inches thick of sandwich. Yeah, oh, it's, it's even more than that, I think. And so I ate the whole thing. I usually eat the half, like you say, and then eat the rest the next day. And they must like just drench it in butter, um, and they must put salt on it. I don't know. But I was just having a meltdown when I got home. I felt like I was on crack. Like it was just whatever it was, it was delicious. The best sandwich I've ever eaten always. That pastrami sandwich is the best thing you can ever put in your mouth. It's amazing. However, in eating the whole thing, I was overdosing on whatever they put on it. It was just too much. And like I was just miserable. Like I was just crabby and I felt like I couldn't move. And I felt like I just felt yeah. really bloated and anyway i was i was home 10 minutes i was i was absolutely asleep that sandwich put me asleep for 12 hours <laughs> <laughs> but anyway so that was my food that was my food thing so today we're going to talk about what glenn i i wanted to talk to uh you today about the whole idea of uh service culture and you know we we've spoken before about like how i understand the hotel industry but i don't understand necessarily the day-to-day -day operations of running a hotel okay it's about Hiring the right way. It's not about training. It's not about brands. It's about hiring good people that were raised right and are, aren't animals and know how to treat other people. Okay, show's over. All right, great. Thanks uh, Thanks for that. We'll be back next week. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Uh, all right. So, but dude, uh, I, it's like I, I, I can literally eat this microphone right now. It's like I just had a conversation with a really? good friend. Really? I thought of you mine. were full after that giant sandwich. Oh, my God. No, <laughs> that giant breakfast I had with you. But, but I just had this conversation. I was speaking, and I, I, will, I will completely change the entire story just to kind of um, make sure that the guilty people aren't found guilty. I was talking to a friend of mine in California, and he was about to hire this young lady, and she was going to be a big person in his business, and I went on... Her LinkedIn, and I looked at her 
history. And there was something about it that just didn't sit right with me. And I can't tell you to this second what it was. Well, I could tell you what it, it was. It was a lifetime of career experience. And all of that kind of comes together in uh, that Malcolm Gladwell blink kind of a moment, right? Exactly. Wow. Well said, Glenn. Thank you. Shit, the more I hang out with you, the smarter I become. <laughs> I always say, the more you speak, the smarter I look. <laughs> um, so... It was just that blink. It was like, okay, not good. Right. Anyway, that person, before they accepted the job, blew themselves up. But I knew instinctively that this person wouldn't be right for the job. And that's what it comes down to. It comes down to everything in your career and everything in your life has to make sense. Or like you were saying, that blink tells you it doesn't make sense. Right. So when you're behind the front desk and you have the right uniform on and you have the right smile... And all of a sudden, shit hits the fan because I'm in a bad mood, which I'm not ever at the front desk. I'm never rude. But say I was. Now, all of a sudden, that fake smile comes off. That uniform doesn't right. matter to me anymore. And you handle it really poorly. Now, is that poor training or is that poor raising? Were you just not raised right? Can be both. Okay. But I, can't, I, can't, I can't actually challenge on that because I agree. But... Chances are, statistically speaking, it's Can you more sing chances about, are first? Chances, chances are. are. You know, uh, big Johnny Mathis fan. Oh, love Johnny <laughs> Mathis. And, and 90% of people listening have no, no idea no what Johnny, idea Mathis, Johnny is. Mathis is. <laughs> so, chances are. I was listening to, uh, you know, uh, every once in a while I like at this time of year to do the uh, the holiday radio, right? And the Christmas mm. classic traditions. And uh, Jim Neighbors was, oh, love uh, Jim Neighbors. was, was singing. And what a voice. Gomer Pyle had. He, he could rival Sinatra. Unbelievable yep. voice. So we were saying. Yes. Raising or training. And you were saying that both. So explain that. Well, I, I think um, there is an element to it. How, um, you know, you've got to give people the right training in order to be successful. But at the same time, if they don't have the right attitude, if they haven't been conditioned to be that right type of person that understands service culture ahead of time, then you're going to have a huge problem. Listen, you and I, we do this podcast. You have a lot going on. I have a lot going on. There's a lot of pressure in our business, our family, everything. And we always have fun. We never, we, I don't think we've ever had an argument. I don't think we're ever like miserable with each other. And we have fun because right. we understand that we need each other to make this a good podcast. And we like each other. And we, that's just the way we are, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you can't train me how to be a good partner in a podcast. It's just who I am and it's who you are. I have a partner in, in one of my businesses. And all we do is laugh. Under, right. under the most extreme pressure, we laugh, and that's all we do. It's so you have to hire people you just want to be around. And I, I, like, I teach this. I talk about it. It's in my eCornell Build Your Personal Brand course. It's, it's everywhere. I talk about it constantly. But it comes down to just simple kindness. And do you want to do it? There's two types of people. The first type of person is I give you a report, and you say to me, Oh, thank you, boss. And you turn around and you roll your eyes. And there's another person that I give you a report and you go, thank you very much. You turn around and you go, oh, wow, okay, I have a new report. I, maybe I'll learn something from here. Maybe I can prove to my boss that this, this, this is going to be the reason I get promoted because I'm going to give them back an incredible report. That's it. It comes down to those two types of people. The people that are always like, oh, oh, I have to work another 10 minutes. Oh, I have to do this. Oh, I have to do that. Or it comes down to, okay, I got to get this done, prove myself, and I'm going to be a superstar. It's like my entire life, all I want to do is prove myself. To this second, all I want to do is prove myself, no matter how hard I have to work. And that's just the way I'm wired. I just don't understand when people hire people knowing they're going to be paying the ass because you spend 90% of the time handling them, uh, handling human resources issues. And Glenn, can you, can you tell everybody that sometimes I close my eyes and I go for five minutes without opening them and I don't know why I do that? Like no, I just uh, did. Uh, we both do that. Oh, really? I, I never think, noticed that. Yeah, uh, what happens with me, and then you'll tell me if it's the same thing for you, is when your brain starts to think and it, your mind is going to take over with whatever point you make, it makes sense to block out all that other right. stimulus. It, it helps for me to clarify and focus. And a little secret here, also sometimes we won't look directly at at each other right? right because that if i'm looking at you sometimes it'll 
distract me just a little itsy right. bitsy tiny bit that I'm not able to clarify the point that right. I want to so make. So it's just interesting because as I was talking to everyone just now, I had my eyes completely closed and I didn't realize it until the end, but it's something I sometimes do when I want to make a, when I'm really passionate about something. So, Well, you we see that with uh, singers on stage? They do the same oh, thing. Yeah. We talk about good to great, right? We well, talk about, we were talking off, off mic about good to great. Right. And I, I want to talk about that in a second. But one place that's gone that I think is uh, great and has an amazing service culture is the Garden City Hotel, where we are uh, right now. And what I love about this place is they're so super friendly. You can't walk two feet without people saying, uh, hello, how are you? Is there anything I could do for you? I'm glad you said that because in between uh, takes, I, I went to the restroom and I, I walked down the hallway and I was coming back. And someone just said hello to me with a big smile, and they were very busy. They were running down the hall or walking fast down the hallway because they had a client they had to deal with, and they were just very pleasant. But in this hotel, like, there's not a spot on the wall. There's not a smudge. There's nothing. It's always right on. And it's because you don't have to tell people, here's your checklist. Make sure there's no right. smudge on the wall. It's they walk down the hall and you can see them like cleaning that smudge, even if they're not in housekeeping. Right. And it's uh, literally the uh, the polar opposite than the last show that we did on the uh, the big sleazy Hotel Impossible episode mm-hmm. about a really bad um, uh, hotel that was in uh, Listen, New Orleans. it comes down to pride, yep. man. It comes down to pride. It sure, it sure does. But... Um, let me finish my polar joke because here at the Garden oh, City shit. Hotel is the uh, the Polar Express Tea on December 22nd. You want to come check that out at 2 p.m. Uh, World to be Polar Express themed tea service. PJs and slippers are encouraged. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of kids activities there, including reading of the book, letters to Santa, free gifts for the kids and a cookie decorating situ- uh, station. Sounds like a lot of fun to me, even as an adult. And, you know, I hate talking about the Garden City Hotel simply because I feel like I'm giving them a commercial. Um, but this is not a commercial. This is like, like if you live within a two hour distance of this hotel, come for the weekend, stay, stay in a beautiful room, go to the spa and eat in a David Burke restaurant. I'm telling you, in all the hotels in New York City, and I love a lot of the hotels in New York City, this is my favorite simply because it's in the neighborhood, it's in Garden City. And you don't feel that power of New York overtaking the hotel. I just love this hotel. All right, I don't want to talk I about do it too. anymore. And, uh, the name no of more that, free commercials. The name of that restaurant is uh, Red Salt Room by David Burke. And I want to talk about good to good to great, but we do have to pay our bills. So everyone, just stick around. I'll be right back after this. Hey everybody, Glenn here. So listen to this. Cobblestone Hotels is celebrating their 10th anniversary, and man, have they accomplished a lot in the last decade. Already, they have more than 150 hotels throughout the United States, but they're in smaller and medium-sized markets. Those markets that the big franchise companies, they're underserving, they're overlooking, and in some cases, just ignoring. But Cobblestone is an expert in these markets. And their president and CEO, Brian Wagernese, listen, I've gotten to know him in the last 10 years, and he has worked every job possible, including being an owner and operator. I can personally vouch for how awesome this company is, how awesome he is as an individual, because he understands the importance of finding the right combination of hotel brand and franchise owner. He's also an incredibly dedicated professional. Whether it's a cobblestone hotel and suites Main Street design, Borders Inn and Suites, or one of the newly acquired brands such as Boulders Inn and Suites, Key West Inns, Centerstone Inns and Suites, Cobblestone has brands that range from economy to upper mid-tier and one that's right for you. Quite simply, Cobblestone Hotels is the franchise for franchise owners. Patrick Mullenix, well, he's their cobble, he's Cobblestone's new president of franchise development. Give him a call or check out their website at cobblestonefranchising.com. But give Patrick a call. He's a great guy. I've known him for a really, really long time, too. You can find him at 920-216-0620. That's cobblestonefranchising.com. And tell him Glenn sent you. Okay, we're back. Thanks for putting up with our, our, our commercial break that right there. And you know what? I love Cobblestone Hotels. Those guys are so awesome. If you're in the hotel business and you're thinking about creating a, a hotel, 
in a smaller town, these guys are for you. Plus, they've made some great acquisitions, which we talked about in the ad. You're going to want to join that family of hotels. But, uh, Anthony, we're talking today about going from good to great, creating that amazing service culture. What do we have to do to, do, to achieve that? Give me an example of a company you do business with. Could be a grocer, could be a major computer company, could be any company. Give me an example of a company that you admire. Company that I ad- admire. Well, I, you know, I fly Delta Airlines all the time, and as much as people give the airlines flack, I think I get treated pretty, pretty nicely and have positive experiences with them every time. Why do you think that is? I think that they understand that they need to have a good service culture. And honestly, over the last five, six years, I've seen a marked improvement about how they treat people. Something has gone on there that they've man- managed to reorient Why do you think the that culture. Is? I think the leadership has put an emphasis on that and made it a um, a hallmark of what they want to be. But I know what your next question is. No, you don't. It has to do with the hiring, of of course, right? All right, all right you know. My <laughs> I can see it in your face. <laughs> no, what I was going to say, but they do something very specific. Yeah, they treat their people the way they want their guests to be treated. Yes, that's absolutely. Period. Right. End of story. Yeah. There you go. That that's it. That's the secret. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Treat your employees. Overdo it, and that doesn't mean in money. Just in in. The way you treat people, just be overly respectful to people, appreciate them. Now you say, oh, Anthony, listen, no good to goes and punish. I pay people well. I incentivize them well. I pat them on the back well. I kiss their ass. I do everything I can, and they still don't do what I asked them to do. And that's your fault because you didn't hire right. So yes, so that doesn't mean you stop doing the wrong thing. Or you don't stop doing the right thing. You still you still keep doing the right thing and get rid of those people that you made a mistake on because those people who are doing a bad job for your guests are your responsibility and your fault. It is your fault when you don't think it's your fault, it's your fault. And when you're not thinking it's your fault, remember it's your fault because it's always your fault. Glenn, right. Yeah. No, it's your fault. Uh, uh, yeah. Just like your wife <laughs> says. No, it's true. It's like, you, it's your business, man. I've never seen a business go out of business because of the employees. I see business go out of business because of the owner. And right. And it, the employees might suck, but that's because of the owner. Listen, I've had employees on my team that sucked and they didn't last long. Right. And sometimes they did last long because I was too weak to fire them. But it's not their fault. It's my fault. Right. You know? And so, it, listen, this is the service culture in this country. Somebody asked me the other day, I was doing a, a speech, and somebody asked me, what country do you think does service well? And I've only been in Asia for a very short time when I was in Vietnam. So I'm going to keep the whole Asia part of the equation out of it because I know people right. say that Asia is a whole different level of service. And that's just a cultural. I think there's a lot of cultural reasons there. But people say in Europe, what's your favorite country for service? And I got to tell you something. I don't have one because I've been in places like Rome in, in, in Italy and it's been great service. And I've been in places in Italy that have been terrible. Right. I've been in places in Finland, Sweden, Norway – and the list goes on, that had great service, not bad service. I've been in New York. I've been in, I've been in 48, country, 48 states and have had good service, bad service. It comes down to the way you're treated and the way you're hired and who hires you and how, and how that culture feels. Outside of, like I said, like the Asian culture, I think that that is just different because they were raised a certain way, right? Right. And so, so you don't really have to train them on, on service. All right, so we do have listeners from all over the world. It's we really, do get it's, out of here. It's really great that people are catching on to this show from you know countries and all these different continents there. But here in the United States, um, I, I see you know service can be a hit or miss kind of a, of a thing. So what would you tell operators are the, the things that you should be looking for in somebody when you're in the hiring mode? Have a mission statement, and I call it a service state statement. Have a tagline for your hotel, and make sure that your tagline, your service statement, lines up with that person's personality. So if your service statement is, we will treat everyone the way we want to be treated, um, whatever it is, make sure the pe- person you're talking to feels that and right. knows that, and, right. and you can see coming off of them. So, and again, stop with all the formulated questions and just look at somebody, have a conversation, just speak to them, Right. you know, because I am going to, it's it's, it's like tennis, right? 
So tell me your best quality. All right, my best quality is this. Right. So tell me something you suck at. Well, this is what I suck at. Okay. Right. And those are good questions that I ask. I ask what you suck at, and that helps me. But I want to know what you had for dinner last night. Right. Where'd you go? Mm-hmm. What'd yeah. you do last night? Because now I get to know you as a human, and you start talking to me as a human, and then I'll throw some formulated questions in there, and then I'll get you more comfortable. But I want to know, like, I want to know who I'm talking to. Like, if I'm going to bring you into my company, I want to make sure that I want to go out to dinner with you too. That I want to like know who you are. I want right. to know, like, I want to know what kind of person you are. Now that doesn't necessarily I'm gonna take you out to dinner ever. No, I know. But but I want to be able to hang out with you. So what are some good questions that you could ask that help create that dialogue for spontaneous conversation that gives you a good understanding of what the person's characteristics truly are, not the show that they're trying to put on for you. What sport you play in high school? Uh, I played bench. <laughs> okay, why'd you play bench? <laughs> I am not athletic whatsoever. Although I did play soccer growing up. Okay, what, what, did you like soccer? Yeah, it was fun. Okay, so besides sports, what else did you do in high school? Um, that's a great question. I hardly remember high school anymore. It was 30 years ago. I, I spent a lot of time trying to find myself and running away from people trying to beat me up. Okay, why were people trying to beat you up, man? Because I was scrawny. So when did you realize that you need to stand up for yourself? Um, hoping to, that's my night, 2019 <laughs> New Year's resolution. Okay. So no, I would, but what I would do is, I would um, never hire you. We're in an interview. No, I would never right. hire you because you didn't show any strength. Right. No, but the fact of the matter is I would, what I would say in that situation is that I learned to deal with that by finding a sense of humor and disarming people through jokes and stuff like that. And that's something that got me off the defensive and put me on equal footing okay, as others. Okay, so that was an interview question. You right. just, you had no idea you were in an interview. Right. And you answered it that way, and now I know you have a sense of humor. Right. So now I talk to him about, you know that new Italian comedian, uh, Matt Escasco, whatever his name is? No. Okay, well, he's like the hottest thing right now, selling out stadiums. <laughs> so I talked to you about that. Who's your favorite comedian? Right. Who's your favorite comedian? Uh, George I Carlin. All right, yeah. Oh, dude, he was so freaking amazing. Right, so now now you and I can talk about George Carlin for five right. minutes. So now I know what kind of personality you have. Right. Now I know you're kind of a right. sarcastic guy because George Carlin yeah. was, was a sarcastic guy. He, he what was. What are the seven curse words you can't say? Uh, God, another explicit rating on the show. Let's see. Um, I, know, I know. Don't say them. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said them on my other podcast. Right. Don't say them. <laughs> All right. I will, not, I will not say them. We'll let the audience. Right, uh, but my point is, is... I now know you like comedy, I know you like George Carlin, and I know you're sarcastic. Right. Does that fit into my company? It may or may not, but I didn't ask you any interview questions, and I got to know you. I know when you were a kid, you didn't like sports. I know when you were a kid, right. you, felt, you felt a little insecure, and you got over it by humor. Okay, so now, now I have good questions to ask you from mm -hmm. a business perspective. Right. How did, when was the last time you used humor in a business conversation because you were out of your league or you were nervous and you just needed to tell a joke to get the hell out of there. I would say that that's my uh, secret to networking. Tell a joke and get out of there just like George Costanza used to do. On Give me an example. Um, whatever it is, if you're having a conversation with anybody um, in the networking situation, I'd love to do a show on great networking at some point in the future. But um, – some of these conversations, it, when you're in cocktail party situations, can seemingly have no end. You could get trapped in conversations, and if they're not good for your career, they're not helpful in the moment. You got to get out of them. So, if you make a joke, it's a perfect opportunity to say, uh, "Hey, great talking to you. I'm out of here," because it's a natural pausing point. That is a great, great tool to use. I tell terrible jokes and I don't remember any of my jokes, so that wouldn't help me, but that's a great tool. And now I just learned something from you in an interview that's like, okay, so this guy knows how to get out of situations and right. this guy knows that wasting... So, so this is what I got out of it. If I send you to a client meeting to Vegas, you are not going to waste time. You, were, right. you just told me that you know when... You're in a conversation with somebody who's wasting your time, and you know how to get out of it. So I know if I send you to Vegas, you're going to start closing deals for me because right. you don't want to waste time. You know how to get out of it. So do you understand? So, so in an interview, you want to get to know the person. I just learned that you like George Carlin. I mm -hmm. learned that you like comedy, and I learned that you know how to get out of a awkward situation. I didn't know any of those things before we sat down on this microphone. I just did that interview, and I asked you one interview question. Right. Does yeah. that make sense? I think that makes uh, that makes total sense. So let me flip the equation now. If you think you're just good, 
and you want to be great, what are some of the things that you can do to improve your inner self in order to make a great impression, not just during the interview, but in your career? Do the work when nobody's watching. There's a person that I um, that I just met. Uh, her name's Heather Hardy, and she's a she's a boxer, she's a world champion. I'm very emotional today because I'm I'm just like when I think about this woman's career, she's worked hard her whole life. She's a champion, and she still has to sell tickets to get into Madison Square Garden on on a big card. Mm-hmm. And she's working two jobs in order to support her family. And she's a world champion, undefeated boxer. Right. She's a single mom, right? She's a single mom. Right. And she's a world championship boxer, and she's still got to sell tickets. And 7 o'clock in the morning, she's Wait, a, she, she has to sell? She's a world championship boxer, and she needs to sell tickets? She had to sell $36,000 worth of tickets the other day uh, to be on um, to get into Madison Square Garden on the boxing card, or they wouldn't put on the next boxing card. They're like, okay, we'll put you on the card. We know you're a world champion. We'll get you in Madison Square Garden. But you need to you need to sell tickets. That's disgusting. Yeah, I don't think Mayweather's selling tickets. I don't think any male athlete. No, selling they're they're tickets. too busy writing up checks for fifty million dollars. Right. So I don't think there's any male athlete selling tickets, and um, that pisses me off. But my that but th- that's a whole other conversation I can go on because I have three girls, and that that woman treated that way is uh, just and, yeah. Check out uh, this is a good time to uh, uh, check out the extraordinary podcast, which you release every Thursday. And she's actually on that podcast, and. She, thank you for that plug. Sure. And, but she does the work. Like this morning, I interviewed her yesterday for my Extraordinary Podcast. I had a very long day yesterday. I was exhausted. I fell asleep. She was in the gym yesterday morning, 6 a.m. We picked her up from the gym at 1 o'clock. She was on the podcast. She had 27 other things to do before she got home. She gets home. She cooks dinner for her, for her daughter. She probably does the laundry, cleans the house, whatever. This morning at 5.30 a.m., she's taking a picture of Gleason's gym because she's in the gym at 5.30 a.m. this morning. And she does that every single day. So how do you go from good to great is do the fucking work. Don't talk about it. Be about it, as Chris Romulo says. It's like I am sick and tired of people saying, but I, I'm, I don't have opportunities and you know, I'm really good. And it's like, shut up. Right. Do the work. It's like, listen, I'm working. I'm working all the time. And it's and it's I, I, I'm not just working to make money. Sometimes I'm just working to work to because maybe down the road, six months from now, something there's an opportunity. I'm working on a talk show. I right. will get a talk show on national television. Mm-hmm. These podcasts help me become a better interviewer, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm doing these podcasts not because it's making me a lot of money. It's because I enjoy it more than anything in the world, but because I am honing a craft that I want to get really good at because I know I will be on on a national station or I will I will have an amazing talk show one day. But that could be 20 years from now. It could be when I decide to retire and not right. be in the hospitality business. So I'm working at my craft. So just I would keep like to have working. a uh, I would like to have a shitty talk show one day. I want to like bring back thick of the night. Okay. <laughs> then be, they should, you know where I was talking yesterday about uh, a game show yeah. and uh, what do you think about this game show? Um, you know there's a million character actors, right? So I show you a face right. of a character actor and you have to name the movie or the show they were in that you remember, and then you have to, uh, and then you get X amount of dollars, and then you have to name who they are, and then you have to name all the shows they were in. Or That's a great idea. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Because there's a there's a award ceremony I just found out about in L. A. called the Carney Awards, and the Carney Awards is ap- uh, named after R. Carney from the yep. Honeymooners because he was a great character actor, and the gentleman that's in that started this whole program wanted to give back to all the great character actors, and he's showing me the program for for the show that he just put on a couple months ago, and I was like, oh my god, I know him! Oh my god, I know him! Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! <laughs> and you're like, I like the character actors more than I like the A listers because right. they're in a lot more movies because they have to right. make a living. Uh, and the best thing about uh, uh, character actors is how cool would that be? To make a successful living acting and not have all the stress of having to open the movie. You know what? It's actually easier to open the movie than to be a character actor because I know some character actors right. that are very dear friends of mine. And dude, to make Grant is tough because yeah. character actors just don't get paid paid enough. And it's hard. It's a grind. So i much rather have the stress of opening an A-list movie because I make a lot of money and I can go to sleep for like five years. So it, it's a great, but anyway, so my well, point uh, being is- I like, was going to say, I, I heard you're getting the uh, the lead in the Aquaman sequel. I'll do it. <laughs> I think I'd be a great actor. But anyway, <laughs> that's kind of one of my underlining dreams one day to actually uh, be in a movie. Actually, I was in a movie, but that's a different story. So even character actors, they work really, really hard. Right. Do the work, man. And this is the key. If you're asking me the key for success, 
before I give you my word, what is your word? One word, the key to success. Give me one word. Well, I'm still thinking about how uh, I was going to say I was on a uh, I was on a TV series once. Yeah, I don't care what's the uh, word. Unfortunately, it was America's Most Wanted. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> I knew a joke was coming. What's the word? What's the one word that comes to mind when, when it comes to success? From good to great. What's the one word? How do you get from good to great? What's the one word that every single human being I, I has would, to have in order to go from good to great? Attitude. The right attitude. Yes. But that's However, not the you can have the wrong for. attitude. Or you can have the right attitude and still not be successful. I'm going to give you one. I'm going to give you a name. Mm-hmm. Ron Howard. Mm-hmm. Okay. If I say Ron Howard, describe Ron Howard for me. Uh I see someone who's reinvented himself and never wants to stop learning. Right. So the word would be he went from being a child actor to a teenage actor to a director to a world class Oscar winning director to literally he would be in the Hall of Fame of like humans in in drama like yeah. in, in TV in in the arts right just in in anything in any category of achievement. What do you think his his What do you think his personality is like? What do you think his reputation is like in Hollywood? I think it's uh, really positive. Maybe not as uh, not the same as Henry Winkler, who's like the nicest guy in the world. But I think he comes in a close second or third. Yeah, but you can't compare the success that Henry Winkler had no. to Ron Howard. No, completely different level of success. Right. Ron Howard is at the top of his game. Henry Winkler's done well, but you know mm-hmm. he's not at, at the Ron right. Howard level. But do you, do you have you ever heard anybody say anything about Ron Howard? Nope. How do you know he has a great reputation? Because you've never heard anything about Ron Howard. So the word is consistency. Mm, great word. I know a lot of people that know him, and every single person said he's the hardest worker, first one in, last one out, treats everyone like he owes them money, mm-hmm. okay, mm-hmm. with nothing but respect, and that he works for them. His life is about consistency on and off the camera. Right. So you can talk about attitude. You can talk about intelligence. You can talk about being a person that's resourceful. But consistency is what you need in this business. Now, since you know me, right, There's we've kind of formulated a reputation for each other. Mm-hmm. Like I know how you work. You know how I work. You know how I'm going to show up. I know how you're going to show up. Right. We haven't really varied from the way we work. Because we're consistent in our in our behavior. The one thing that I can't deal with in a business or even in my personal life is inconsistency because I don't know if I can count on you. So if I go to the gas station and there's a gas station I go to and they're always out of gas, so stop going there. I don't go there anymore. Right. It's inconsistent. So I go to a gas station that I know there's always going to be somebody that'll pump my gas because I don't like getting out of the car and they never run out of gas, right? So consistency is the secret to successful people. I would imagine you can take um, an actress or a director or a nurse or a doctor. I'll tell you my doctor. The doctor's helping with my leg. I sit with this man. He's the vice chairman of NYU. Right. And this man treats me like he, like like I'm his son. Like he has nothing else to do. Not that I would be a son because we're about the same age. But like he has nothing else to do. So I would imagine he does that throughout his career. And everybody knows when you're in his area of expertise and he's talking to you he's going to treat you with respect and he's going to give you the time of day not like he's a busy doctor right. i went to another doctor's office with my daughter who, who rolled her ankle the other day and my um daughter got in a car and she goes he was in a rush and he had no other patients right and i would imagine that's how he lives his life and that's why he probably doesn't have as many clients because he always, he looked he was in a rush he barely looked me and my daughter in the eye and he, he wasn't doing anything he had nothing else going on he had no other clients matter of fact when we left i saw him go sit at his desk so consistency is the key to getting yourself from good to great because people don't want the best person. People don't want the funniest person. People want you to be counted on. Right. And that's why you decide to do this podcast with me. Not the best or the funniest person, but I show up. <laughs> not only show up, and I'll be honest with you, not only show up, you, you run it. I mean, you, you always got the equipment. You're always ready. You always got questions, and you're consistent. And I have... Like, I'm not a nice person when people are inconsistent. Like, right. I'm nice, but, like, I'm, I have no time. Like, when you say, give an example. If I'm at a cocktail party and somebody's talking to me, right, and, like, you're taking my time and, like, you can see I'm not interested and you're not smart enough to realize, okay, conversation over, I will end that conversation. Right. I will probably end it abruptly. I'll be nice about it because I'm not rude, 
But when I walk away, you may say under your breath, what an asshole. Right. Just because like, like, dude, what are you doing here? Like, we're wasting time here. I have no time. You're, you're like, we're here to establish whatever we're here to establish, right? Yep. This is a cocktail party for whatever. We get to get, got to, we have to know each other. And you're talking about shit that doesn't matter. I got to go. Yeah. You're not being consistent. Right. To why I'm here. So I just think the word consistent is the key to success. I think that's a, a, a great way of putting it. Man, definitely learned a, a, a lot today. But um, I think before we wrap up the show, Anthony, I want to know something that I don't know about you. You know, I wasn't really prepared for that question today. And I'm always prepared for that I question. I know. Much more so than me. I'm usually the yeah. one panicking. You want me to go first? Because I am actually prepared go today ahead. for one. Something I don't know, Glenn. Um, I, I really have an irrational dislike of coffee cups with too wide of a top. It really frustrates me because the more surface area there is for the coffee, the quicker it cools off and the less coffee I can enjoy drinking. I can't believe you go through life with that problem. It's, I mean, I, it's, you... it's not good, Anthony. Wow. I'm really sorry to hear that. Yep. So that's something you didn't know. Okay. But you and know, I, those, I'm sure you still but, wish you didn't. But, but, but no, <laughs> the, the, those little like inconveniences in life can really get on your nerves. It really does. And it's one of those things. And to me, it's very symbolic of um, you know, trying to figure out systems and solutions to everything in your life so those little things don't right, okay, bother give you. Give me an example. You, I'm sorry. I, mean, I, I, I went out and I bought coffee mugs that I like. That work well for me instead of sitting around going, shit, I hate these freaking coffee mugs. Okay, so one of the things that, like you said, you have to make sure that you don't get yourself in these situations. And I hate going into a gas station and I'm too far from the pump. Because what's the next word out of your mouth when you're too far from the pump? What's the next word out of your mouth? And you get out of the car and you realize it. I just go, fuck. And exactly. I have to go back in the car. That's exactly yeah. the word. It's like every single person that, that does that goes, fuck. Right. Right? <laughs> I hate that. Uh, but those little things in life, the little annoyances, I'm like, fuck. Right. Um, okay. So something asked me the question. What's the All question? right. So, Anthony, tell me something I don't know. I was in the United States Air Force, and I was up for Airman of the Year on right. my base, or actually for the region, which is a really big deal. And I'm in a competition in Nebraska. Um, we drove up from we drove up from Missouri, and um, I think I'm ahead in the competition. I think I'm going to win, and I lose to this young lady. And I was upset, not that I lost to her, but that I lost. And then we all, after after the competition was over, we all went upstairs. Um, we changed, and then. Um, we went to get her, me and a couple of guys. Hey, let's, let's go. Congratulations. Let's, uh, let's go get something to eat. And when she opened her door, it smelled like marijuana. I was like, the mm. airman of the year fucking smokes marijuana. I was pissed off. I don't mind losing, but you're in the military and you're smoking a joint. Like, I was so, like, anti any of that. Like, I'm in the military, man. It's like, you can't do anything stupid. And you just won Airman of the Year, and you were smoking a joint. And I almost, almost rat her right. out. But the worst thing in my neighborhood growing up in Brooklyn right. is you don't rat. No, you certainly don't. And I didn't rat. Well, uh, I, but I was pissed. I will say I'm a little pissed that you're using the word marijuana instead of cannabis, which is the right word because marijuana actually has racist overtones. Yes, I know he's furrowing his brow at, at me because when um, they try when they started to demonize it um, and William Randolph Hearst really was afraid of hemp coming along um, and, you know, uh, he had all these uh, forests for you know to create these paper factories for his newspapers and stuff like that. They started blaming the Mexicans and calling it marijuana because it sounded like that word. So they it was a racist demonizing thing against people that used uh, this this substance. I learned something every day from you. Yeah, well, you know, I'll it, just say pot. Yeah, all right, that's good. I like that. I Where's like, the word pot come from? Um, that it's a good question. I don't know. You could you could look that up. I always uh, some of these nicknames are strange, like uh, Mary Jane and Reefer and and all of that. I don't know where they come from. But today, in our politically correct society, it is uh, cannabis. He's looking it up right now. Do we have an answer, or are we just going to learn about pots and pans? <laughs> Why is marijuana called pot? Actually, the origin of pot has nothing to do with the cultural, with the with the culinary tool. The word came into use in America in the late 1930s. It's a shortening of the Spanish. I can't say the word that came from another word. I can't say um, a wine or a brandy in which marijuana buds have been steeped 
So you know what? How about this? Why don't you go on dictionary.com and say, why is marijuana called pot? Because the words palagua, palagua, um, mm-hmm. I can't really say. That's all right. So why don't you read this? Uh, maybe you're smarter than I am. Uh, well, I'm definitely not uh, smarter than Palagua. All right, Palagua. Here, here we go. Why is marijuana also called pot? Uh, the word is potaguaya. Papaguaya. Or potaguaya. Potaguaya. That came from uh, potacion de guaya, a wine or brandy in which marijuana buds have been steeped. It literally means the drink of grief. Oh, wow. Well, pot is not the drink of grief. No, it is definitely not the... Uh, it's the... It's the, it's the um, Drink of how you doing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, I've been to enough fish shows in my life to know that the people on on the pot are not grieving at yeah. all. Listen, I say it all the time, man. Ban alcohol and make pot legal, even though I'm not a pot smoker, because I've never seen anybody ruin their family for smoking the joint. That's uh, that's absolutely right. Um, I think Anthony that we should take the show on the road and go to uh, Denver, for example, and and get you stoned on the air for the first time. I think that would be hysterical. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> <All right. laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. Let's get stoned on the air. I All like right. that. <laughs> I, I love it. Maybe you know. I haven't maybe. been. I, I, I've never. I've never smoked marijuana, so that would be interesting. That would be. That would be interesting. It's something to actually uh, think about. So, Anthony, okay. I uh, just hope nobody from high school is listening to this broadcast, right? Because <laughs> they'll call bullshit. <laughs> And if my children listen to this uh, broadcast, I'd never smoke marijuana. That's exactly right. And uh, same to my kids. So, uh, Anthony, tell us where to find you. You can find me on a street corner on 42nd and 9th, about 10 o'clock tonight. I'll be I'll be selling the marijuana. And he's also he's also got two for one deals, so you're gonna to want to check that out. Uh, Anthony Hotels, anywhere you want to be on the internet, Glenn. And I am at Traveling Glenn, uh, anywhere you want to be on uh, the internet. And be sure not to just download this show, but download. Anthony's other show, Extraordinary, which focuses on great interviews each and every single week. And, of course, I got the No Vacancy with Glenn Hausman podcast where I talk to the uh, top folks in the hotel business, the Hotel Tech podcast, and the Hotel Design podcast. And let me tell you something. I've been in the hotel business 32 years, and I, everybody you know knows me from the TV show, but and I'm pretty well known in the industry, obviously. But I would think you're more known in the industry than even me. Everybody knows Glenn with two N's. They may know who I am, but they all want to talk to you, and nobody wants to have anything to do with me when we're in the room together. That's for sure. Uh, my, that's not true. No, it is true. It happened even this morning as Did we walked really? into this hotel. What happened? Uh, somebody came up to us, Anthony, just started talking to you. And, and what did I do? Well, you were kind enough to direct the conversation, this is Glenn. But I've seen this time and time again whenever we do speaking engagements together, whenever we're hanging out together. Everybody loves themselves. So I'm Anthony Melchiori. And, and uh, what do I do every single time? Well, you're, I'm not saying this is about you. No, this no. Is just, what I'm saying is it pisses me off. Yeah. It's like it happens with my family. It's like I always say... And this is so and so, and I always direct the conversation there. If you like, that's so funny you bring that up because it makes me so fucking uncomfortable. Where it's like, dude, I am not that important. You just ignored another human being standing next to me, and you've completely disrespected them. Are you out of your mind? So now I don't like you because if you come up to me. And you say hello to me because you know who I am and you, you enjoy my show and you, and you like me. Whatever. Great. I love that. But you as a human now have to stop and introduce yourself to my friend or that's going to irritate me. So, right. yeah, I'm sorry about that, buddy. No, nah, nah, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm very happy. Look, I make a decent income. I have great experiences. I'm a happy, well And I think you're guy. taller than I am, so you're all good. Oh, there you go. And, uh, and I've got much <laughs> more you're... luxurious hair. <laughs> 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 For now. <laughs> okay, so we got to go. Where we got to uh, go? All right, we've got uh, we've got to go somewhere. We're here at the Garden City Hotel. Maybe we'll go grab some lunch here or something like that. I hope you guys all come down to the Garden City Hotel. What a great place. What a great time. I want to thank each and every one of you for checking in it's checking in with anthony and glenn teaching you to be the hotel you're that you wanna be it's checking in with anthony and glenn